Welcome to Maven Project's educational session on vaginitis diagnosis and treatment with Drs. Jan Herr and Joan Lister. Dr. Herr is a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. She retired from Kaiser Permanente in San Rafael, California after 33 years of practice. Her focus in recent years has been midlife women's health and minimally invasive surgery. She was the Kaiser Permanente Northern California lead for midlife women's health. Dr. Lister retired after practicing OBGYN in small towns in Western Massachusetts for nearly 30 years. She began her career working in an HMO in the Boston area and spent two years focusing on OBGYN ultrasound. She has helped train pre-medical students, medical students, and mid-level providers. So um, doctors, you may begin um, sharing your slides and um, proceeding with the talk. Thank you so much for being here and a special thank you for collaborating on this talk. And I love the bi-coastal relationship that you guys have formed. <laughs> okay, so I'm Joan Lister and I'm gonna get us started here talking about vaginitis, a very common and somewhat underappreciated topic in women's health. I don't think that either Dr. Her or I ever had two consecutive days in the office without seeing someone with vaginitis. Okay, can we move on, Jan? So the most common reasons that women call for help is that they have vulvar itching, they have discharge, and or they have odor. Sometimes they um, call after a failure of a home rem remedy like dilute vinegar or an over-the-counter remedy. It's, I know it's hard to believe, but there are women who really don't want to come see doctors. And if they get these symptoms, they will try to avoid the time and trouble and expense of seeing us by going to the drugstore where they'll find on the shelves numerous treatments for itching and discharge that fall into two categories. Many of them are good treatments for yeast vaginitis. And some of them, the Vagisil products in particular, are only um, topical anesthetics that will numb the area uh, temporarily but um, do no good and sometimes some harm in the long run. So lots of times you will get calls after failed attempts at self-treatment. And with these people, um, it's important to wait for at least three to seven days before you have them come in because you cannot assess them when they have these treatments on board. Okay. So what causes vaginitis? It, in spite of the fact that most of us think, oh, that's yeast, uh, the most common one is actually bacterial vaginosis, followed um, by yeast and by trichomoniasis. All three of these are quite common. There are other conditions, particularly inflammatory conditions in the vagina and on the vulva, contact dermatitis and lichen sclerosis Edotrophicus, which can cause uh, itching and irritation, often confused with vaginitis. Postmenopausal atrophy has similar symptoms. So we really do recommend encouraging women to come in and be seen. Um, and that involves not only collecting the history, but then doing an exam um, of the vulva Sometimes you will see thin, white, pale patches suggest and, and or scarring um, between the labia, the labia minora, labia majora, between the labia and the clitoris. These are suggestive of lichen sclerosis. Psoriasis is going to look kind of thickened, a pale pink, sometimes with little fissures. And then general dermatitis, which can look a little more erythematous. After that, uh, insert a speculum and you try to use only warm water, no lubricants, which can interfere with the testing you want to collect. Looking carefully at the vagina and the cervix and then um, collecting a DNA probe test such as a firm, 
which you may or may not want to send at the end of the day. Also collect a test for chlamydia and gonorrhea if you think there's any uh, possible reason you might want to do that. Uh, then using a wooden spatula or a plastic spatula, put a little bit of the discharge that you can collect from the sidewall, or if there's no blood, you can collect it from the posterior fornix, and put a little dot in two places. You can use one slide and put a little dot in two places, depending on the size of your cover slips, or you may have to use two different slides, and put it a little bit on pH paper. Then, Next slide, add saline to one sample and KOH, potassium hydroxide, to the other sample. Take a little sniff of the potassium hydroxide uh, sample. This is what's called a whiff test. And if you have bacterial vagin vaginosis, you'll know because it's quite a prominent odor that comes from that combination. After that, put covers, mix them both up and put cover slips on each sample and look under the microscope if you have access to one. Um, you should be able to see yeast, bacterial vaginosis, um, trichomoniasis, and even um, atrophic vaginitis from changes that you can appreciate under the microscope with no use of dyes or any other prep of the slide. Um, however, these tests are not totally sensitive. So if you don't see anything, you don't know how to explain what you're seeing and what you've heard from the patient, that's the time to send a DNA probe. Next slide. So we were just going to present a few cases to illustrate the, some of the challenges of um, diagnosing and treating vaginitis. This is the first one. So a 22-year-old um, nulla paris woman who is sexually active in a, with a female partner um, presents with complaints of a first episode of bubble vaginal paritis and thick white discharge. So she's one of the people that went in and tried an over-the-counter treatment and her symptoms got better for a little bit, but now they're worse than ever. It's important to note that some of these over-the-counter treatments can cause irritation of the vulva. Um, at the same time, they're actually doing their job in, in uh, curing the infection. So uh, transient irritation is not necessarily a treatment failure. And I think the one-day treatment, which is um, the most potent, obviously, because you only use it one day, that's the biggest culprit for causing this kind of irritation. Anyway, moving on with this lady, she has a negative past medical history and she's had only one partner in the past two months. Next slide. When you examine her, she has some erythema both um, on the outside and in her vagina. There's some excoriations and some little fissures on the vulva. The cervix has some patchy erythema and the vagina has some cottage cheese like white discharge. The pH is four and the whiff test is negative. Next slide. Okay, now I'm on. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that probably everyone watching this guessed that this is most likely going to be Candida or yeast. Um, when on the exam, the cervix can uh, look a lot like this inflammation, petechiae, very nonspecific, really. There are quite a few uh, vaginities that might present this way. Uh, but under the microscope, uh, these are hyphae and spores. And um, Again, uh, the discharge is white and watery or white and thick or white and chunky or maybe none at all. Um, there's often labial and or vagin uh, vaginal pruritus. There's dyspareunia, dysuria, genital edema, fissures. Um, and it's not an STI uh, and the male uh, partners don't usually require treatment, but they may present 
with a rash or irritation itching and then of course would be treated uh, usually topically. Um, so again, just talking about what Joan was talking about, how do we, what do we see? Uh, looking at the discharge, uh, seeing whether there's a positive whiff, there should not be with uh, candida. Um, the pH should be low. Um, if it's high, it, then you think about all the other uh, questions, all the other possibilities. Um, but um, if it's low, then that goes along with yeast. Um, and if you look at under at the KOH under the microscope, the uh, most of the time you'll see spore uh, spores and hyphae, but you can also see uh, just spores or just hyphae. And if a DNA probe is sent, uh, then uh, that can show yeast, which in this case, it, uh, I don't think we probably sent it because um, I generally only would send it for uh, cases where I didn't see anything under the microscope and didn't have an explanation or was concerned that maybe there was yeast I wasn't seeing. And certainly for recurrent cases, you might send a DNA probe, but it's the culture that's going to give you the speciation that you need. Um, so the other, um, the other thing to say about this is just that colonization is very common. So because a pap shows yeast or even a culture that's done for another reason or a probe shows yeast, if the patient's asymptomatic, you, you do not and should not act on that. Um, so colonization uh, is frequent, as I said. Uh, symptoms probably are due to an immune response to the candida. Uh, and uh, the women in their lifetime will have at least one uh, yeast infection. And then there'll be women that have trouble with recurrent frequency in five to 8% of the cases. Uh, and uh, most of them will be uh, uh, albicans, but there are other species such as labrata. Um, I think if somebody's not muted, could you mute because there's some background noise? Thanks. Um, so looking at the symptoms and uh, the risk factors. Um, obviously, if someone's taking antibiotics, pregnancy, obesity, diabetes, immunosuppression, uh, hormones, uh, both vaginal and systemic, uh, can, uh, can present with yeast infections more commonly. And the treatments, and there's a very long list of uh, possible treatments, all for the most part, prescript um, over the counter, and uh, and the terconazole is prescription. And I won't read through all of these, but you'll have the slides to refer back to. Um, if a patient has vulvar symptoms significantly, then using um, either just an antifungal if there is an itching or uh, or uh, significant inflammation, or just combining it on your finger, anti antifungal and hydrocortisone, they can apply uh, together, which is very successful, or uh, TAC, triencinolone um, ointment. Ointment stays on better than cream, so ointments are a better choice uh, when you're using these type of medications. And um, even if the patient doesn't have any that, uh, vaginal symptoms, if you don't treat vaginally as well as to the vulva, uh, that uh, is an issue. Now, those are the topical uh, uh, prescriptions, the only the terconazole, I'm sorry, over the counter, only the terconazole is the prescription drug. And Diflucan is, of course, the oral option. And uh, seeing as Diflucan is now over the, uh, I'm sorry, is generic. <laughs> um, you don't um, you don't have the same issues of cost, and 
it is in general when women are asked, the preference is for oral. Uh, but there are some contraindications, of course. So uh, if there were problems uh, in terms of the liver, you wouldn't want to give diflucan. Um, the other thing that I want to just say along these lines is because the, they are equally effective, um, you can go with patient preference. There really isn't a reason to choose one of the others unless there are contraindications. And um, the last thing that I'll say is there's no contraindication to sexual intercourse, although of course, if it's uncomfortable, it shouldn't happen. Um, but it, there is no specific contraindication to that. Um, so in pregnancy, fluconazole is contraindicated, but uh, a seven day course of any of the options that we were talking about would be fine. And the ACOG vaginitis document is very good and recent um, and has a list of this and many other uh, over the counter options that are available. Um, this, this might be myth, uh, but even, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the CDC uh, does, does mention uh, washing the genitals with warm water, gentle soap only, uh, not soaking in a bath. Um, and every uh, gynecologist I know would probably say use cotton underwear or avoid sweaty exercise clothes and wet bathing suits. And I still kind of believe in these things, but I have to say, I can't find any data. So uh, you don't have to uh, perpetuate the myth if you don't choose to. Um, in terms of complicated yeast, uh, this is really the plague of both women and physicians that take care of them, as well as, of course, the nurse practitioners, um, not to mention the nurses that answer the phone. Uh, four times a, a year or more would be referred to as complicated, and that's eight or 10% of women. And if they have the other uh, candida species, such as glabrata or uh, parasylosis, uh, then these can be an issue and uh, the organism can become, be eradicated, but the symptoms can last a lot longer. Uh, if the symptoms are very severe or the findings are very severe, that falls into what is called the complicated category for yeast. And the failure rates can be 35% within a month uh, in these complicated cases. So for um, treatment, uh, this slide lists the uh, first option, which is the diflucan and mo more than uh, one dose. And then seeing, is that working? Is the culture showing eradication? And if so, still repeating it ongoing once a week in order to prevent recurrence. And that'll con control the symptoms in 90% of patients. But when it, uh, when it stops, 50% of them may not get another uh, infection uh, for quite a while, but 50% may. Um, and if there is recurrence, then you want to repeat the culture and sensitivity and resume the diflucan unless there is uh, resistance. Um, if there is resistance, then and you're talking about consulting with a specialist because you have to get rather creative, but this is uncommon. Um, and then there are the over-the-counter options. And I'm going to mention here that boric acid looks pretty good in terms of studies, so is another option and can be purchased uh, in some pharmacies or online or mixed by using zero zero gelatin capsules. Um, and boric acid, but of course you have to remind women more than once not to take it orally because it's poisonous and uh, that it has to be kept away from where children might be able to get at it. And Nystatin also has some data that it is effective, but you want to look at the culture and sensitivity for that. Um, if you've got one of these uh, rarer strains that are more difficult, Boric acid actually appears to 
work. The problem is compliance with, with this. Uh, also, nystatin, there's some anecdotal uh, success with. Uh, Diflucan is uh, another option, but it is uh, not as effective. Uh, so it, these, these cases get to be very challenging. Um, another uh, candida, Crucii, is uh, resistant to uh, the fluconazole. And so you have to use topical azoles in these cases. And uh, there is oral ketoconazole or itraconazole, but um, they have more toxicity. We don't go to them as the first uh, try usually. Um, so now we're on uh, case number uh, one, but the patient uh, comes back and she was doing well, but now she has a thin gray white discharge and vulvovaginal itching and burning. And she thought it was yeast, so she's used the over the counter uh, and the symptoms persisted. So, as uh, Dr. Lister said, uh, you had to wait till we could bring her in. Um, and she does report a uh, fishy odor during menses when she comes in. Okay. Okay. So when she's back in and you look at her, she also, again, has some vulvar erythema, but this time her discharge is um, thin and watery. It's kind of a gray white color. Most importantly, her pH is five and her whiff test is positive. When you look under the microscope, um, and this time you're looking at the saline prep, the KOH prep destroys all of the cells except the yeast, which, which is why it's really good for finding yeast, but it's not good for the other um, vaginitis. So when you're looking at the saline prep, you're going to see um, what, what's in the right-hand picture, clue cells. So, so for comparison, the left-hand picture shows normal vaginal epithelial cells, and they have nice um, sharp edges, whereas the clue cells, uh, the edges are kind of coated with these um, little bumpy, um, probably bacteria, and um, that's diagnostic of uh, bacterial vaginosis. Next cell, next slide. Um, so the diagnosis is based on the, the discharge being usually watery and gray with maybe some little bubbles, a bad smell, even without the K KOH, uh, a pH that's higher than you would find with yeast. Um, whiff test is positive and you see uh, clue cells under the microscope. However, a lot of times you're going to have a slide with a lot of white blood cells and sometimes even some red cells and it's hard to be sure that you're seeing clue cells. So there's no shame in sending the DNA probe um, to confirm that this is bacterial vaginosis. Next slide. Um, it is the most common cause of abnormal discharge in reproductive age women occurring at very um, high rates. The associated risk factors are many and um, they're not easy to explain why these should increase the risk, particularly with black women, Latina women, um, we don't really know why they are at higher risk. There doesn't appear, appear to be anything different in their biology. Um, so something environmental, but we don't know what. Next slide. Um, interestingly, uh, women who have women's sexual partners, there often is con concordance between the two women. Um, if you see a patient with bacterial vaginosis, if she has a female partner, uh, it's over 90% likely that that woman also will test positive. Similarly, women who are negative for bacterial vaginosis, their female partners usually also test negative. They don't recommend treating uh, female partners on the first go round. 
but with recurrent bacterial uh, vaginosis, um, female partners should be evaluated and treated. Um, bacterial vaginosis is a nasty one be it because um, it seems to impair um, our um, defenses against uh, infection and inflammation. So it's associated with all kinds of things um, that are either infectious or probably related to um, infection. That would include pregnancy complications, infertility, abort spontaneous abortion, preterm birth. Um, it includes um, pelvic infections, endometritis and pelvic inflammatory disease, infections after all kinds of pelvic surgery, including abortion and hysterectomy. It also increases vulnerability to other infections and ease of transmission of other infections. So uh, HIV, um, the uh, transmission is markedly increased and acquisition is moderately increased. Acquisition of herpes, um, acquisition and persistence of HPV and related uh, dysplasia um, and acquisition of the common sexually transmitted diseases of uh, chlamydia and trichomoniasis. Um, so co-infection is also really common with bacterial vaginosis. Um, 20 to 30% will also have yeast and 60 to 80% will have trick. And this is when your DNA probe is particularly useful because you may think that the person has one form of vaginitis, but when they come back the second time, if you're not sure, I think sending um, a DNA probe is very helpful because you may find you're dealing with two or three things at once. Um, uncomplicated first episode of bacterial vaginosis, standard treatments. Um, and usually I just ask people if they want oral treatment or if they prefer vaginal. Of course, the advantage of vaginal is you're not giving somebody something systemic. Um, so that can be done with metronidazole, metrogel um, is a five day course at bedtime each night. Um, and clindamycin cream or ovules. Um, the cream is a seven day course and the ovules are a little less messy and they're a three day course. Um, the creams and the gel are kind of messy and people don't like them for that reason. So many people will um, request oral treatment. Um, the standard of care is generally metronidazole, which is a pill twice a day for a week. Um, tinidazole is fine. I think it's a little more expensive, but it has the advantage of being a two-day course if you're using two grams each day or a five-day course if you're using one gram. Uh, tinidazole has a longer half-life than metronidazole. You can also use clindamycin either um, if it vaginally, as I mentioned, or it can be given orally 300 milligrams twice a day for a week. Um, unfortunately, bacterial vaginosis also tends to recur. There's more than half of women who will have a recurrence within a year. Um, using the same treatment a second time often works, particularly if it's been a long time, more than six months since you treated the first time. I would just go with the second um, treatment of the same thing that worked before. Next slide. Um, it's complicated during pregnancy and breastfeeding. There isn't any evidence of pterogenicity either in metronidazole, um, clindamycin, or some of the other azole, cyclinazole, or tinidazole. There's no evidence of pterogenicity, but that's not the same as saying there's been adequate experience to say for sure. Um, with breastfeeding with uh, either metronidazole or secnidazole, you have to wait a while after uh, treatment's completed before you can resume uh, breastfeeding. And the other thing that's interesting about pregnancy, you would think with all those pregnancy complications, you would definitely wanna treat, 
But the evidence is somewhat mixed whether or not treatment helps prevent the preterm birth and uh, the other complications in pregnancy. Still, symptomatic person is not going to want to wait till the end of pregnancy. So I would go ahead and treat um, either with uh, uh, metronidazole or probably clindamycin. Next slide. Um, so um, what causes this persistence? It seems to be that the biofilm, which as I understand, that's the layer of organisms that coats the vaginal mucosa. Um, having Gardnerella vaginalis in that biofilm seems to be rela related to susceptibility to getting bacterial vaginosis and to persistence and recurrence. Um, the other thing is um, that it can be sexually transmitted uh, and treatment of a female partner is probably important once you get into persistent or recurrent disease. Treatment of a male partner does not seem to be helpful, but use of condoms for uh, three to six months is probably a good idea. And thorough cleaning of any shared uh, sex toys might help. Um, again, there are all kinds of complicated regimens for control of persistent and recur recurrent bacterial vaginosis because it can just be really difficult to manage. So we've listed two here. One is uh, completely vaginal and one starts with oral metronidazole and then moves to vaginal boric acid capsules and to uh, finally to metrogel. Um, the nice thing about the boric acid capsules is they're very good for treatment for yeast as uh, Dr. Herr mentioned. Um, and yeast is a common uh, side effect of both having um, bacterial veg vaginosis and of long-term treatment with metronidazole. Um, so you can get decent control with these kinds of um, regimens, but sadly, 50% will recur within three months of treatment. Next slide. So now we're going to move on to a second case. Um, this is a 50-year-old woman, Gravita 3 Para 3, with moderate genital paritis and somewhat unpleasant odor for um, three weeks, but no vaginal discharge. She too has tried an over-the-counter uh, antifungal cream, which she completed a week ago. She has not been sexually active since her husband died um, about five months ago. Next slide. On exam, there's moderate introidal and vaginal erythema, some little bit of yellowish discharge, the same kind of spots on the cervix that we saw earlier with uh, yeast. Um, but the pH in this woman is five and uh, the WIF test is negative. So it's not a perfect fit for either yeast or bacterial vaginosis. Next slide. So when you look under the microscope, this is what you might see. Hopefully. It will just take, it'll just take a minute to load. This is an organism that probably only gynecologists truly appreciate. We love seeing this little beast. There, if you look where the arrow is going, hopefully, there's a little organism with a little, there's one. 
wish they put the arrow up. It's in the lower left. Okay, there's another one. These little organisms move. They swim about randomly and they have a little tail or uh, they're flagellate organisms and the little tail whips around, uh, propelling them across your slide. And they're very easy to recognize. Um, once you've seen them once, you'll never miss them again. They're bigger than, than what you would see uh, with a yeast bud and much more mobile. Nope, not that one. It's probably on the chrome one. Nope. Chan, do you see it? Um, is it up on your toolbar opened? Well, I'm going to just keep talking while we're yeah, getting this. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm just going to go out okay. and go in again. Okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, trichomoniasis um, can have vaginal discharge, not always appreciated by the patient, usually yellowish or greenish. It has some malodor, but not the true fishy smell of bacterial vaginosis. It does cause pruritus. It also causes dysuria and frequency because the urethra is infected in about 90% of women who have this. Also causes dyspareunia and sometimes postcoital bleeding. So to make the diagnosis, um, you look for the characteristic um, discharge and under the, the saline prep and the microscope, you look for those little organisms we just saw you, showed you. The pH should be higher than 4.7. And again, a DNA probe is a sensitive and a specific way to diagnose TRIC. There also are some other lab tests like the TRIC rapid antigen tests. Um, there are cultures for TRIC, but they're only available through state um, public health labs. And we only use those when uh, we have recurrent persistent TRIC that we can't explain in any other way. Of note, oftentimes you'll get a pap smear result that will say that trick is present, but this is not reliable. So don't treat um, this. You might want to ask about symptoms for someone who has that show up on a um, pap smear, but don't um, use it for diagnosis or treatment. Okay, we can go to the next slide when we, there we go. Next slide. Okay. So TRIC is the most common non-viral STI worldwide. It is a sexually transmitted disease, um, but only 50% of carriers have symptoms. It can be present and untreated for many years. Um, I once saw an older widowed woman who claimed she had been abstinent for um, over five years. And there they were on the slide swimming around. Um, it is more common in older women. We don't know why. It's more common again in women of color. We don't know why. Um, women um, with bacterial um, vaginosis are more likely to acquire tricks. So think about that too. Um, trick, trick by itself does increase the risk of acquiring and spreading HIV and other STIs. Uh, two or three fold. It also increases the risk of infertility and of adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, so um, almost always, TRIC is very easily treated. It even doesn't require good compliance because 
it's a one-time dose to the patient and the partner with a very high cure rate. Allie. One thing I do suggest is that you tell a woman to have her partner get the prescription. He doesn't have to even be seen. You can write the prescription for the partner and have the two of them take it together at one time. Um, tinidazole has a slightly higher uh, cure rate, but I believe it's still more expensive. Um, of note, um, alcohol can make you feel pretty sick when you mix it with metronidazole or tinidazole. So that should be avoided for 24 hours. And um, it is recommended to avoid intercourse for a week. Um, these people should be retested after three months because 20% will be reinfected. Um, okay, so when you see people coming back again and again with TRIC, it's usually that there's a partner somewhere in the web who has not been treated. Um, so that's the thing to stress. Sometimes it's difficult for people to admit that they have other partners, um, but you're never going to get this one solved without everybody being treated. The um, resistance to metronidazole is low and to, to tinidazole is really low. So um, that it's usually that somebody's not getting treated. Um, allergies to these medications are very rare, um, but um, desensitizing people who are allergic is usually the way to go if you have, um, if you are treating this uh, disease. So sometimes um, if people are coming back for a second or third time and they feel pretty sure that everybody's been treated, it's worth a try of more intensive um, medications. So giving the metronidazole for a longer period of time, giving it um, in significant doses or using tinidazole. Um, sometimes you can add uh, para, I don't even know how to say that, paramosmycin uh, vaginally. Um, but that is really only done um, after you've done a culture through the CDC and in consultation with an ID specialist. Okay, and I think that's it for mm -hmm. trick. So back to you. Okay, next slide, please. Just going to let you keep running it. Thank you. Um, okay, so second part of the same case. Go back. To, we didn't tell the history on this patient. Yeah, I don't know what. Okay, good. There it is. Uh, so a year later, the patient comes back. She has dyspareunia. She has a new partner for a month. Intermittent pruritus, yellow green discharge, but no odor. And of course, um, if we treat her over the phone, we'll just treat her for BV again, which just drives home why it, that doesn't work very well. Uh, her last period was four months ago. She's taking an over-the-counter menopausal medication for increased hot flashes. Next slide. On exam, she has erythema, uh, slight flattening of the vaginal rubi, purulent discharge, a pH of six, and a negative whiff test. Next. So this is uh, very suspect for atrophic vaginitis. Uh, and uh, you can see that things look very flat and shiny. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> So there are a lot of different um, signs and symptoms that you can see. Uh, atrophic vaginitis is part of a larger category called genitourinary syndrome of menopause, uh, abbreviated as GSM. And you'll be seeing that more and more in the literature because that's been an agreed upon international term. Uh, the uh, decreased estrogen production, loss of blood supply is uh, what seems to cause this problem. It does not improve with age, other menopausal symptoms. And 50% of women at some point in time will complain of some 
symptom related to GSM, but a lot of women suffer it and are not treated. So in terms of treatment, uh, for mild symptoms, vaginal moisturizers and lubricants uh, can be tried. Vaginal estrogen is by far the most effective um, and most commonly uh, used uh, treatment. Uh, they, and of course, it comes in all types of forms. Uh, DHEA is uh, occasionally uh, used as well. There is an FDA approved product for that. And it may be in, uh, beneficial in women with breast cancer, although it hasn't been 100% proven, um, it, it may be a uh, better option for uh, women on aromatase inhibitors. Uh, Testosterone is not FDA approved, but it also comes under consideration with women uh, who are being treated for breast cancer. <clears throat> and ospamaphine, which is the, an oral product, does work, but it's expensive. It's an oral product with risk some risks associated with CIRM, so it, it is not a first line uh, treatment. Next slide. Um, I'm just going to mention uh, disclaimative inflammatory vaginitis. Um, and it's listed on this slide as saying 8% of persistent vaginitis, but some studies think it's up to 20%. It, the re there's not enough research on it really. We don't understand it very well. Uh, but again, it can look like atrophic vaginitis. It's common in women with low estrogen. Um, and women that are pregnant or breastfeeding, you can see it. So there are other categories of women uh, it, you can see this with. And these women can be quite uncomfortable. Uh, so I just mention it for when, um, when you're kind of running up against the wall and don't know uh, uh, what it is. So next slide is just to show what it might look at like during the, mic during the uh, exam, um, the my microscopy. And it is good, again, the DNA probes help with this as well, or can if you have access to that uh, in, in sorting it out. And my last slide, next one, is uh, different treatments that you can try um, and uh, the problem is that there's often recurrence of uh, this problem. And because you're using hydrocortisone or clindamycin, then there can be a yeast infection. So uh, using uh, a uh, fluconazole comes into a, uh, the picture with that sometimes and using vaginal estrogen, which has usually been tried before, but still might be useful in concert with the uh, other treatments is useful, but these patients need follow-up. So um, you can tell that between Dr. Lister and I, we're, uh, we have a lot to say about <laughs> vaginities. Um, most important, it, uh, if it's if one uh, if it's missed, what is the most important uh, diagnosis that really could cause trouble uh, would be BV. Uh, next slide, um, and that is because of the increased risk, as Dr. Lister already mentioned, of all these uh, serious problems. And the last slide and the message that we really want you to. Uh, remember is that treating women by phone is really not ideal. And especially during the pandemic, we saw a lot of it. Hopefully things are getting more normalized now. Um, I have seen errors and women that are uncomfortable for much longer than they need to be and side effects from the various treatments such as Dr. Lister was talking about with the using the topical um, anesthetics that can cause serious inflammation. So we encourage you to examine these patients. And that's it. Wonderful, Dr. Lister and Dr. Hur, thank you so much for such a comprehensive um, talk and lots of great tips that are there. And um, so for anyone listening and feel free to type in any questions or if you want to, you can unmute yourselves and to ask the question as well.
Well, I thought we went too long because there wouldn't be time for questions, but hopefully what it is is that we told you everything. And you need to know. I, I wanted to add one, one small thing to the treatment of um, postmenopausal atropic vaginitis. Um, the, those products that are used vaginally, the estrogen products, um, are, are not um, dangerous in women who have had or, or do have breast cancer. So although they come with the same little um, patient information blurb that tells them they can't use it if they've had endometrial cancer or breast cancer, actually they can. And oncologists are comfortable with us using that. Sometimes you only need to use a little bit um, on the introitus to correct uh, dyspareunia, um, but using a little bit vaginally is not counterindicated in women with breast cancer. So I'm just gonna, from the West Coast, say the oncologists are not so happy about it here, <laughs> so you have to discuss it. Regional, regional differences. Yeah. Um, and, and that the problem is with the aromatase inhibitors, when you're you're trying to get the estrogen down, estrogen down to like sub zero, that the, there is some increase. The estrogen is the lowest in mm -hmm. terms of how much circulating estrogen there is, but that's why I mentioned the DHEA and the testosterone. Sometimes you have to get quite creative with it. Also, women are nervous about it, partly because of the labeling, which is incorrect, that it can increase the risk of breast cancer in women that don't have breast cancer. So you have to have a conversation, at least on the West Coast. With the no, I think the conversation is all, always good and even touching base with an oncologist that's taking care of them. Right. Great. And here's another question. Other recommendations for atrophic vaginitis that are over-the-counter non-hormonal? Um, well, replens is one that a lot of people like because it hangs, it's a lubricant that hangs around longer. Um, but some women, uh, it seems to build up in their vagina and then creates kind of a yucky discharge. What, what's been your experience, Jan? Um, there are quite a few different um, uh, cat, uh, meds in that category, but there's another um, over-the-counter, but I'm blanking on the name of it, uh, that was actually developed in Greece and some people... Um, I'm going to have to look it up. I'm sorry. It's one of these things that never really caught on, um, but I've had the occasional patient use it um, with some success. So Jill, I'll, I'll try to look up and see if that product is still available. And if it is, I'll let you know. That's great. And then I can pass it On along. the tip of my tongue. <laughs> okay, great. Um, here's another question. With BV suppressive therapy, do you give a standing order for fluconazole for secondary candida? I'm happy to do that. Um, I think I, that's very reasonable. Yeah, there's a, I mean, yeah, we could be over treating that, the problem with it, but it is so common that yes, I would. I agree. Great. Wonderful. Just a last call. Any other questions? If anyone wants to unmute themselves um, or to type, type it in, it's fine. We'll just wait a few more seconds. I remembered it's hyaluronic acid mm -hmm. and the brand name was Hyalo. Um, and it works in a different way and it looked promising as a possible treatment, but I don't have a lot of experience with it. Okay, great. Well, Dr. Herr and Dr. Lister, thank you so much again for your presentation today. I really appreciate your bi-coastal collaboration. It was wonderful having all of our attendees today as well. I will send an email to you all with um, the slides from today and then a reminder to check our Maven Project website for the recording, um, which will be probably in about two weeks. If you go to the mavenproject.org website in the upper right-hand corner, it says recorded sessions, and that takes you to our Maven Project um, YouTube site with all of our recorded sessions there. 
And then for those of you who have attended the live session, you're eligible for um, one hour of CME and you'll be receiving um, a CME um, post-session survey today that you can fill out. And as a reminder, UCLA, our creditor, will send out a summary certificate for all of your Maven Project CMEs at the end of the year. I hope everybody has a great weekend. A thank you to all of our providers for taking such great care of your patients. Take care.